Okay, thanks very much. So I'm going to be talking about uh, low dead space syringes and uh, the impact that they have on risk. I'd like to declare an interest at the start because having understood the, the impact that uh, low de dead space in syringes has on blood-borne virus transmission risk, we've developed uh, needles that are available to needle and syringe programs. So in my, in my 15 minutes, I was just going to uh, quickly run through a bit how this is part of changing our understanding about risk, um, about the whole idea of viral burden, um, syringe type, and HIV and hepatitis C. So I think over the last sort of five or ten years, our ch understanding of what risk is about is changing. That we, a lot of us came from health and social care backgrounds, and we thought about things in terms of the information people had and the choices and the decisions that they made. But over the, over the years, more and more environmental factors have been, uh, been highlighted and shown. And so we, our understanding of what risk is about has to include a, a, a good understanding of the environment. And by that, I mean things like uh, the underlying prevalence of blood-borne viruses. So, you know, the chances of uh, a syringe that you share being infected with HIV are relatively small in the UK because so few people have it. But nearly half of syringes might be... Uh, have uh, hepatitis C because it's so, it's so much more there. Obviously, if HIV prevalence goes up, then the sharing is the same, but the risks become much greater. Obviously, the drugs being injected and the frequency is an environmental factor that's, um, that's separate. Um, there was uh, um, Avril Taylor's research in Glasgow using video research, which showed that people were trying to avoid sharing, but because syringes were all the same in the environment, sharing was happening far more often by accident than it was as a deliberate act and uh, syringe availability as a, just a feature of how many clean syringes are in a community of injecting drug users makes a big difference to how often they're shared and how often people catch uh, viruses. Oh, sorry. And, so, and then this last one is syringe type. So that's a, that's a whole new thing that's come up. Um, until, until 2010, when people switched from insulin syringes to uh, syringes for de detachable needles, our only concerns were about vein damage and using bigger needles. We didn't really uh, think of them as being in any way uh, different. But then this guy, Bill Zula, who's a former injecting drug user from Texas, came to talk to the National Conference on Injecting Drug Use. Um, and he was asking the question, well, what, what it, how much virus, what is the viral burden in different types of syringes, and does it make any difference? So he, he'd done some work looking at that. And uh, so just to be clear, what we're talking about is the viral burden is how much uh, virus is in the blood and then what the dose of blood that you get when you share equipment is. Um, now, I think our general understanding was that where there'd been contact with blood, there was risk. That was that end of story. Uh, but it's a bit more complicated than that because he calculated how much HIV would be left in a syringe after it had been rinsed, uh, just rinsed with water in the way that an injector typically would just to prevent it blocking. And uh, what he found was that during uh, latent HIV infection in a, in a standard <coughs> syringe, so we're talking about a syringe for detachable needles with a, um, a, a Lewis slip needle on top, uh, the, there was 10, 10 HIV copies in a rinsed syringe. But in an insulin syringe, it was one viral copy per 100 syringes. So they're much, they're really uh, often not there at all. Uh, even during initial HIV infection, calculated thousands of HIV copies in a, in a, in a um, syringe with detachable needles and just 10 in, in, a, uh, in an insulin type syringe. And again, when somebody has AIDS, the viral burden is much, much lower. Um, and that is simply a, a, a feature of how much blood there is in the two different types of syringe when you've, when you've finished using them. And of course, when you rinse it, you, 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 take the, you take the blood and you dilute it. You flush that out, you have a more dilute solution, and then you dilute that again. You quickly reduce, massively reduce the amount of uh, blood that is in there. So he d decided he would see what impact having using different types of syringes had, had made uh, around the world. It's a fairly crude study, but he simply uh, found uh, cities all over the world, 67 cities, and he asked them to send him uh, samples of the syringes that they were distributing, them, and he divided them into high, into high dead space and low dead space. And, and he also asked them about their HIV prevalence. And <clears throat> so he just divided them into two groups, the ones who are mostly using insulin type syringes and the one who are mostly using uh, syringes for detachable needles. And in the low dead space insulin type, um, 
the, the blue is uh, HIV prevalence of less than 10%, and the red is an HIV prevalence of greater than 10%. So under what seems to be a clear relationship between the use of high dead space syringes and, and higher HIV prevalence. Um, using the modeling and that understanding, they did, so he, here they're talking about so almost forcibly switching people from high dead space syringes to low dead space syringes. This was modeling of what they thought uh, could be achieved in China with their HIV epidemic if they uh, effected a change from high dead space to, to low dead space, um, which and these are high prevalence, high prevalence figures. Um, hepatitis is more complicated because it's, uh, it's a more infectious agent, but still you've got less blood at the start of the process, you've got much less after rinsing, uh, so you've got a lower viral burden, the virus is more susceptible uh, and so viral survival will be shorter and there's less of it. So that, again, you're going to be reducing the chances of an infectious dose of hepatitis hitting the person when they share the, share the equipment. Uh, so this has been picked up by the, this is the WHO um, guidance on preventing uh, hepatitis B and C. They're recommending that syringe exchange programs provide low dead space syringes to uh, people who inject drugs. Obviously everywhere in the UK does, but there are countries where they're all um, high dead space syringes that are distributed. So this is the sort of the main thing. That <clears throat> these two types of syringe are not risk equivalent when it comes to bloodborne virus transmission risk. There is a clear difference between, between incident type low dead space syringes and high dead space syringes for um, detachable needles. So there's definitely additional risk and we should be encouraging people, all things being equal, insulin type syringes are a much safer sort of uh, syringe for people to be using. Now, giving, making everybody switch to insulin type syringes obviously isn't a practical uh, proposition. Although interesting, Bill, like his history as an injecting drug user, they, that did happen in Texas. Uh, you, everybody used detachable needles and then all diabetics were switched over over a period of time to insulin type syringes. And Bill's initial hypothesis was, because it had happened to him and it happened to all the injectors he injected with, actually it would be possible to make everybody switch from insulin to, uh, to detachable needles. But I think they were all using one mil syringes and it was, so the switch was a lot easier, whereas for us we would be trying to get people to move from two mil, so it would be harder. And certainly, that's, I think that's, yeah, it's one of the things. So he, He's, he's aware of that and realised there, you know, there are barriers to it. And, and so he um, identified this uh, a thing called a low dead space needle. So these are needles that are adapted to fit on syringes uh, for detachable needles. I don't know if you can see at the back, but basically what they have is a, is a, a plastic uh, spike which comes down into the tip of the syringe and stops any blood uh, collecting there. That's, it's a low dead space needle. Uh, so he thought then that they show great promise, and um, they show promise because the effect, even though there is more blood in them than in an insulin type syringe, once you start rinsing you do clear it out quickly. It's obviously, they, they can be acceptable because we can do a like-for-like -like switch in terms of the business end of the needle. Um, yeah, so that, that's the, that's the <coughs> dead space needle with half, half the dead space of a, of a standard syringe. Um, yeah, so. So he said, they're not going to be available in my lifetime. These things were only developed for, um, for expensive drugs where the, where the loss, where the wastage of drug in the tip of the syringe was worth money. And so they were only being sold at like three or four times the price of a standard syringe. And the companies he contacted them in America, they just weren't interested in any sort of mass production or, or reducing, reducing the cost. Um, well, obviously here things are a bit different. We've got much better national organised uh, needle exchange and, and exchange supplies, that's what, that's what we try and do is identify equipment that is needed for injecting drug users and find a specification and a manufacturer to make it. So we've, we've started that process. Um, there, there, there is some difficulty. I mean, you can see there's still some uh, space at the top of the, of the hub of the needle. But that is because this, when you're trying to get it to bite onto the onto the Lewis lip syringe. There needs to be some space. If you fill that with plastic, what you get is something that goes on but it doesn't stick and that it would, would come off. So we were sort of wrestling with this, the, the balance between trying to get the dead space as low as possible but keep the thing actually usable by people. And again, you can't bring it too far down because you don't want the plunger pushing it off, off the end of the, 
off the end of the syringe. So, so we've um, there's two lengths of orange needle, which is by by far the most pop popular needle. Um, we've got we've just placed the order for the for the blue needles, and um, uh, yeah, we're hoping to to move on to yellow and, gr and green as well. So, what, what's uh, what have we got in the future? Well, when we are working on this dead space versus fit issue to try and improve it and to get the dead space uh, reduced further. Um, yeah, green and yellow soon. Uh, the actual measurement of the dead space has proved quite problematic. So what Bill does is he takes the syringe, they fill it up with water, uh, expel the water, and at first they weigh the syringe. So you weigh the syringe, you fill it up with water, you expel it and you weigh it again. The difference in weight, it's heavier, is the amount of water that's trapped and you can then calculate the space. Now when, when they do that, they, they get a wide variety of, each time you do it, you get quite a wide variety. They pick a midpoint and that is what they calculate as the dead space. Intuitively, there seems to be too much variation in that. You would think that would be a pretty consistent thing because the space doesn't change. So. And it's partly because as a percentage of the overall weight, you're looking for very small changes. So we've had some discussions with Bath University where Jenny Scott works, and they, you know, fine measurement is one of the things that universities do, and they're pretty confident that we should be able to get a much better method. Uh, the other thing they've got is a really cool high-speed camera, like a, one with incredibly good lights, and they're going to just film some, you know, so we can actually see what happens to the to the fluid when it's in there, how the, what happens to the relationship between the blood and the water during rinsing, so that we can try and really get a better understanding of what's going on in, in uh, these dead spaces. Um, and Bill, meanwhile, is trying to sort of uh, improve the understanding, so he's uh, doing a big uh, study in Tajikistan, uh, moving people from all high dead space needle and syringe provision to low dead space, uh, comparing different areas and really trying to get an understanding of what the impact of of switching people to lower dead space syringes is, is going to be. Um, so, I think I've kept it time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Big thing: risk is environment as well as decisions. Uh, viral burden is a factor in whether people catch uh, bloodborne viruses or not. Uh, syringe type is, is definitely key, particularly for HIV. Probably also for hepatitis C, and and the equipment we supply can definitely make a difference. Uh, definitely make a difference. So, uh, yeah. so I've left, uh, Bill, these are Bill's references, so these are on the PowerPoint slide which will be on the website so you can, <coughs> so you can check them out. And, uh, there you go.